Hey, how's it going, guys? My name is Sean Chasen. I'm a composer for film, TV, and video games. Uh, my music has been in hundreds of projects, including things like Beyblade Burst, Ring of Elysium, and PUBG Mobile. And today I'm going to talk about dynamic triggers in video game music. Video games are at their core a non-linear storytelling medium. So in a film or a TV show, you know that for every single viewer, the footage is going to unfold in the exact same way every single time that hit where the person walks through the door will happen on exactly that frame for every single viewer all the time. With a video game, this isn't the case. It's fundamentally a non-linear storytelling medium. So certain players might meander around and take forever to pass through a certain areas, while other players might just beeline through and know exactly where to go or might skip optional things. Regardless, in both of these cases, the music must stick with their play experience and it must support their actions. So we need to create ways for the music to be dynamic and follow player action. The most basic game score you could have would be a single looping track. This would of course get very boring very quickly as it wouldn't change at all based on player action, it would just keep cycling around. So as game composers, it's our job to find interesting ways to have the music be dynamic and change based on player action. Every player should feel as though their unique play experience was followed by the score. There are a few ways to achieve this and I'll go over some examples. Topics I want to cover include collider triggers, button press triggers, proximity triggers, game variable triggers, as well as entrance and exit stingers. So before we get into specific examples, I want to go over some definitions. A collider trigger in dynamic music is when passing through an invisible piece of game geometry called a collider will cause music to trigger a transition in some way. This could be like if you were walking into the king's bedroom and as soon as you enter the room, you know, the, the tension music starts to, to play as you're about to assassinate him. A button press trigger is, as the name implies, when hitting some key or controller input causes game music to shift or trigger. This could be something like dismissing a menu or interacting with a game prop. A proximity trigger is when a musical element, usually volume, is tied to your physical proximity to a game element. So an example of this might be the music for a secret area getting louder as you approach it. Game variable trigger exists when some game parameter's value is linked to a musical element, uh, again usually volume. So an example of this would be uh, controlling uh, the, the volume of a tension layer depending on how many en enemies are on screen, or uh, controlling the volume of a health layer depending on how low your health was. Entrance and exit stingers are just short pieces of musical material that will take us in or out of a loop or any other longer musical material. So an example of this might be uh, a short bit of music that plays when you're killed, a little death stinger. Most of the examples I'll show today are from two particular games that I scored, but I actually wanted to start with one I didn't work on because it's such a striking example of how small dynamic changes can make a score feel so immersive, and it's a great example of a collider trigger. It's uh, from one of the first games I ever noticed dynamic music in uh, Diddy Kong Racing for the Nintendo 64, which I first played when I was uh, 9 or 10 years old. Uh, so obviously this isn't exactly a new game. Uh, <laughs> this came out in 1998. The music was all done by the composer David Wise. So this doesn't look like the most interesting part of the game. We're just flying around the overworld here. But something really neat happens as we uh, progress around to the different areas of the map. So as we enter the snowy area, we hear sleigh bell elements. And then in the island area, we get some steel drums. And some uh, kind of reggae pumping. And then once we're back into the main area, we just hear the bare bones version of the loop. So this is all triggering dynamically. So I'm just gonna go and find the trigger point here. It's at the entrance to this cave. So now we're hearing no sleigh bells, just the bare bones version of the loop. And then as we enter back in, sleigh bells come in. So the trigger here is, is right by the door. So I'll try to cross it slowly. And sleigh bells out. So all of these loop elements were playing the whole time. They all triggered at the same time. That's how they're all in sync. 
but their volumes were set to zero. And then when we trigger them by crossing over the appropriate collider, their volumes come up, which is how, as we navigate the island, we're able to just kind of smoothly shift from sleigh bell to no sleigh bell. So here's a, an example of a collider uh, trigger in Hector, a game I scored a few years ago. So at this point, you're walking through this facility and you're only hearing the ambient sounds of the area, your footsteps and stuff like that. Um, and then when we come across this collider um, on the floor, we'll trigger the explore music of the area. And uh, now we're in. So having the explore music enter like this, uh, as opposed to triggering it on level start, is a, a great way to add some motion and a sense of progression to a game. When the player crosses the collider, the entering music confirms that they're progressing and it urges them forward. So a quick note about colliders that actually start music like this is to make sure you have the devs delete the trigger after the player has walked through it. Before we had that happen in Hector, some players actually backtracked here and crossed the collider again, and it restarted the music abruptly, which sounded terrible. Uh, the fix was just to have the collider get destroyed as the player walks through it, so they can't re-trigger it a second time if they backtrack. Uh, before I move on to another trigger type, I want to give one last example of a collider trigger. So coming up, we're going to walk through this doorway, which has a collider right in it. And when we do, we'll trigger the uh, girl waving hallucination as well as the musical stinger for that. So the stinger is actually completely out of time with the rest of the music. It just happens right when you walk through the collider. There's no timing there. Um, but we found it didn't really matter uh, because the explore music here is so ambient and uh, the hallucination is almost a little bit of a jump scare, so it kind of worked. Including uh, collider stingers like this that happen on, on game events really do go a long way towards making the experience feel really custom as that the player, you know, by necessity, has to trigger that music when they see something or when they experience something. So it, it really goes a long way very easily to making the score feel really uh, dynamic. Uh, so our first button press trigger happened actually just before this moment um, where you're looking around for this, uh, this security tape uh, and then you finally get it back to the control room and you hit start on the, the control room thingamajig and uh, as soon as you hit play and the security footage starts rolling you hear the percussion layer come in. The, this is the layer 2 of Explorer so this was playing all along uh, along with the layer 1 but just with a volume of 0 and when we hit the button to start the tape the volume just came up uh, but what has happened is we've gotten the addition of this percussion layer and it really goes a long way to again driving the player forward uh, where you know you've made progress you put in the tape and now the, the music is picked up and now you, you feel like you you're just being pushed forward in the story so let's uh, hear it unfold we'll hit play And the percussion layer is in. So coming up, we have another example of a button press trigger. Uh, at this point in the game, you're trying to repair the elevator to get out of this area. And when you fix it and ride it up, this uh, calm kind of piano music comes in. And that audio file triggers right when you click the elevator to to go up uh, in the first version though uh, the first piano chord struck right when you clicked it and it was really off-putting to playtesters and made people feel like they had just played a piano chord on the elevator um, so we we had to change that so that we just added a few seconds of silence to the beginning of that audio file so you click the elevator then there's some breathing room and then the piano comes in and it really highlights an interesting uh, point with this is that you must test, you must kind of make sure you're aware of how the music will seem. Though you want your music to be dynamic, you, you don't want it to be so apparent how it's functioning so that the players play the music in a sense. Like if you, if you had a staircase and each stair triggered a different pitch, 
your players would stop what they were doing, would just run up and down the stairs making music. And this could be a really cool mechanic if you were making a music game, but if you weren't, this would be absolutely counter-immersive. And so with the example of the elevator, we had to add some breathing room before the music kicked in so that the players didn't feel like they themselves were making the music. So let's uh, watch that unfold here. So coming up, I want to talk about a hybrid example that uses both collider and button press triggers uh, to create one musical event. So in the game Way of the Turtle, we have this instance where you collect the shell upgrades. And when, we, when you collide with the shell, uh, a musical stinger will play. Uh, but then the player is required to dismiss the upgrade message. And when they dismiss it, then it plays a little cutscene revealing progress they've made in the map. Uh, but the fact that they have to dismiss the message caused a problem. So we couldn't have everything sync up afterwards with, I wanted the torch sequence to time up with the drum hits and then have the little cutscene uh, be timed to the music. But because we had to wait for the player to dismiss the message, we had to split that audio file into two pieces. Uh, though this works, it can create several problems where you have two extreme play scenarios where one player uh, collides with the shell and then they wait a bunch of time before they dismiss the message. And then the other extreme is if a player is just spamming keys and they dismiss the message as quickly as possible. So you have to test and you have to make sure both of these play scenarios will implement fine. So let's watch an example of both of these play scenarios. So you can hear in both of these examples, uh, though it's kind of fine, neither is perfect, uh, but that's kind of what you're aiming for with these extreme edge case scenarios. You have to find what the worst case scenario will be and you have to make sure that that will implement okay. So next up, I'm gonna talk about an example of a proximity trigger. So this is when a musical element is tied to your physical distance from an in-game object. Uh, so in this example, it's uh, the Ghast, uh, one of the monsters in Hector, uh, where this layer, the swirling layer, is attached to how far you are from him. So if he's not around at all, the volume is zero, and if you're right next to him, it's playing at full volume. Uh, so this kind of helps you find where he is and know that he's around. Um, so here in this instance, we kind of have a perfect um, chance to look at it since he's not at eye level and you have to be at eye level to detonate him so we can kind of play around with him so you'll see if i walk away you'll hear the swirling go away and then if we come back we can hear it again so this uh swirling sound is actually made from rubbing a, a gin bottle against a pot and the pot has ridges at the bottom so as the gin bottle gets towards the center of the pot the frequency gets higher so you get that nice swirling effect and then this is then fed through things like Paul stretch um, to make it more ambient. Uh, you typically don't see too many examples of proximity triggers um, but they can be really effective for instances like this where you want to know that a monster type is, is around the corner. Uh, it works best with ambient sounds like this, um, as it can be kind of odd if you're hearing a very quiet rhythmic element uh, in the distance. Uh, but with ambient sounds uh, or just kind of a tension layer, it can be really effective to have the volume tied to your proximity to the game element. So next up, I'm going to look at game variable triggers. So this is when uh, 
different uh, variables in a game, such as health or number of enemies on screen or other things like that, are controlling the volume of layers. So I can demonstrate this in practice with a layered score I have from Way of the Turtle. Uh, so here we have three layers. We have our explore layer. Then our tension layer. And finally our low health layer. So again, all of these layers will start playing at the same time. Uh, but the tension and low health layer will have a volume of zero. Uh, and then as various game elements occur, uh, they will come up in volume. So the tension layer is tied to the number of enemies that happen to be on screen at that moment. So we can simulate the tension layer coming up. As if enemies were on screen. Now that percussion, you know, is in stressful strings and then enemies go off screen so the layer comes off so it's always in sync with the music it's always there just with a volume of zero come in and out based on who's on screen and then let's say our health drops low and then the low health layer can come up And then as we get health, the low health layer goes away. So though these elements are tied to number of enemies on screen and health, it's the exact same implementation as you'd have triggering by geographic location if you were crossing over colliders like they do in Diddy Kong Racing. So something really important and relatively easy to add to your scores are entrance and exit stingers. These are some kind of material that will take you in and out of a loop. It can be jarring if a loop just crossfades to a different loop without any kind of transition, so it's ideal if you can have some kind of material to bridge the gap. With a middleware engine like FMOD or WISE, it's a lot easier to implement this, but it's actually very possible to do it without. It just takes a little bit of communication with your developers. Sometimes, especially for indie projects, they aren't using a middleware engine, so some of these tricks can be useful to know. The first and most simple involves just knowing how long something will take. For an entrance cue, let's look at the intro to Way of the Turtle. When you start the first level, you hear an intro cue that plays over the camera move down to your character, and then it transitions smoothly to the explore loop. The explore loop actually starts at the same time as this intro music, but with a volume of zero. I designed the intro music to be able to blend right into that part of the explore music, and since both audios trigger at the same time, I know it will always line up that way. The game will hold the explore music at volume zero for a preset amount of time and then fade it up after, let's say, 10 seconds. Simply designing your music to work together like this is an extremely easy way to have loops enter without them suddenly starting and is relatively easy for your indie developers to implement. Let's take a look at it in-game. For exit stingers without a middleware engine, the solution is a little bit more complicated but still very doable. In this clip from Hector, we're being chased by the monster. When you encounter him, the chase stinger and chase loop begin at the exact same time. The stinger interrupts the explore music abruptly, which works fine here since it's a jump scare moment. When you get away, or when you die, one of two exit stingers will trigger. The issue you can see here is tempo awareness, since the stingers will have to happen in time with the music. The way we get tempo awareness without the middleware engine is like this. If we know that at 60 BPM in 4-4 time, one bar will last 4 seconds. So the general term of that for one bar's time at any tempo would be 60 times 4 divided by your BPM equals your time. 
So in the example we're about to watch, the chase was at 110 BPM. So one bar would be 240 divided by 110 equals 2.1818 seconds. When the chase music begins, the game begins a counter that counts in increments of 2.18 seconds. When you die, or when you escape, the game waits for the next increment of that time to roll around, and then it triggers the correct exit stinger, so it will land exactly on a downbeat. And then this method can be modified if you wanted it to land uh, every beat or less frequent, like every four bars or something like that. So let's look at the example from the Hector Chase here. Finally, a really simple example of an exit stinger can just interrupt the explore loop. Uh, in the case of a death stinger, for example, this can be really effective. So let's look at this example when we jump down this elevator shaft to our deaths. So the death stinger just interrupted the explore layer here, and uh, then after the stinger is finished and you respawn, the explore layer just comes back. So we actually had a funny situation with this Death Stinger where the first version of it had a lot of uh, short percussive notes. And uh, when playtesters jumped down the elevator, it uh, sounded like they landed on a pile of violins. And so all the playtesters were kind of laughing there. So we had to change that because as funny as that was, that's, that's not the point of this game. So we had to make a, a different Death Stinger here. So I've gone over some examples of collider triggers, button press triggers, proximity triggers, and game variable triggers, as well as some entrance and exit stingers. So it's important to familiarize yourself with all these techniques and learn how they work together, how they can be used in, in conjunction, as we saw with the one hybrid example, uh, and just playing around with these to make your scores as dynamic and interesting as possible. So once again, I'm Sean Chasen, and thank you so much for watching.